Hello, everybody. Okay, this is the part where I tell you to take a virtual seat. Come in, come in, come in. We got you at lunchtime. I know that lunchtime is a coveted spot in virtual world. Uh, usually it's where you hide away from all of the Zoom meetings. So you must really like us. Thank you so much for uh, joining today. My name is Jen Stoikovich and I am the executive director of SF City. I know that we have a ton of familiar faces joining today, but welcome if you have never joined an SF City event before. We're really excited for today's conversation. Um, we're gonna be talking about scaling social impact in a remote world. This is our second um, in this series. And today's event specifically is going to be with three tech leaders um, in San Francisco. And we're gonna be talking to each of them one-on-one -on -one for a brief fireside chat to talk about how on earth they are dealing with the pandemic when it comes to keeping their employees engaged, virtual volunteerism, how they look at philanthropic contributions and all things social impact in this totally wild, totally virtual time. So before we get started, and I know everybody's eager to hear from each of our speakers, I unfortunately have to do all of these housekeeping notes, so bear with me and I will get through them as quick as possible. So first and foremost, as I said, the format for today is going to be three fireside chats. So we will be bringing up each of our speakers individually to chat with them. And then we will do a Q&A at the end where we will bring everybody up. So what that means is don't worry, we will be getting to your questions. It just won't be after each individual speaker. However, you can drop all of your questions in as we're having today's chat. Uh, there is, if you're joining us on Zoom, that little Q&A button down there. Does everybody know that one? Who am I kidding? Everybody's probably like a Zoom aficionado at this point. <laughs> so um, please feel free to fill in your questions as we have today's conversation going. If you are joining on Facebook Live, same thing. You can drop some questions onto our Facebook Live stream. Our wonderful team will be monitoring the questions and we will bring each of our speakers up all together at the very end to talk about some of your questions and we will get to as many as possible. You may also notice up there in the left-hand corner is a little recording uh, symbol. That means that today's conversation is going to be recorded. So if you wanna really, really nerd out on all things impact, you can rewatch it as many times as possible because we will be sharing it and putting it permanently on the internet for all to see. And oh, lastly, social media. So I bet you, you probably heard about this event on social media. Um, if you would like to talk about some of your thoughts on today's conversation, please jump on any of our social platforms at SF City, including our Twitter, and you can use the hashtag, hashtag scaling social impact. Everybody got that? If not, don't worry, Jackie from the team just dropped it right there so you can follow along in the chat. Okay, one last thing. Since we have so many new faces today, I'm gonna just briefly tell you a little bit more about who SF City is in case you are not familiar and why we're having today's conversation. Give me one second, gonna pull this screen back up. And all right, so who is SF City? So we are San Francisco's Tech Trade Association. We were founded in 2012 to empower the San Francisco tech community to have a voice in tech and collaborate with government leaders on solving local issues. So what that really means is it is my job to connect San Francisco's tech industry with the community, with the government, and help foster the kinds of collaborations and build the kinds of partnerships to make San Francisco's tech industry the best citizen of San Francisco that it can be. How do we do that? Well, there's a number of things. First, we, of course, do a number of different um, things in advocacy in terms of working with local policymakers and legislators. Next, we do social impact. That's why we're having today's conversation. We 
work closely with the San Francisco School Board. We work closely with City Hall, and we work with all of the different community leaders, including nonprofits in the area to figure out how we can best utilize tech's resources to help build a better San Francisco. So today's conversation is a big piece of our social impact work, and it's how we can continue to keep San Francisco's tech community working closely with the Bay Area's nonprofit ecosystem, even though we can't be there in person. And of course, lastly, big piece of what we do is events, just like today. So we host regular events with tech, government, and community leaders. Uh, if you like today's event, please uh, check out more of our events. We are continuing to do them in this fun virtual setting until uh, the mayor and the governor says we can come back in person. All right, gonna bring myself back up. And before I bring up our first speaker, I'm gonna run a quick poll of the room. Everybody should see a poll pop up if you're joining us on Zoom. We would just love to know what industry you work in so we can better gauge who we're talking to today. So I'll just give that a quick second. Oh, wow. Okay. We got 74% of you voting. All right, let's grab a few more votes and then we will close it out and share the results. 83%, let's go, let's go. This is exciting. <laughs> wow. All right. So as you can see, what an interesting split. So we have 43% tech folks to 39% nonprofit, pretty close to half and half. Uh, should be a great conversation today. All right. Amy LeBold, Executive Vice President of People at Next Role. I will welcome you to the virtual stage. Let's get started. Wonderful. Thanks for having me, Jen. Hello, hello. How are you? I'm doing fine, all things considered. <laughs> I, love, I love how everybody has to think of an interesting answer to how are you. Usually it's, oh, great, but it's just great doesn't seem quite like the answer to do right now. That's right, that's right. I already was told that by taking this uh, panel in my daughter's bedroom, I was keeping it real. So I give you a real answer to, to that question as well. That'll hopefully be the theme. Yeah, I mean, you are keeping it real. Well, <laughs> before we get started, do you wanna briefly just um, explain a little bit about Next Role and, and what your footprint in the city is? And then we'll talk a little bit about your social impact strategy. Yeah, so um, we're an online marketing platform. Um, we have been around for about 13 years, uh, predominantly in the San Francisco, in the city of San Francisco. And um, we have offices around the world now as well. Um, we've expanded um, into Ireland and we have an entity in England and in Australia as well. Um, and then in the, in the US, we have offices that no one's going into right now in uh, Salt Lake City and Chicago, uh, Boston, and New York. Um, and uh, I've been at the company for, it'll be seven years in January. So um, six plus years at this point. That is, I mean, in tech years, that's like 40. <laughs> <laughs> Don't remind me. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so Amy, what is what does social impact strategy look like for Next Role and, and how has it kind of evolved since you've gone virtual? Yeah, so just setting it up a bit of, um, you know, as you asked, the, there are two distinct times, the pre-COVID time and the, the post-COVID time that we're living, or during COVID time, I would say, that we're living in now. Um, so pre-COVID, our Next Role Gives Back group, which is the group that I'm representing um, of a group of employees around the globe. Um, this is a completely employee-run group that curates our volunteer opportunities and is stewards of the corporate budget um, that we get, which is fairly uh, nominal, but um, we do have a little bit of a, of a budget. We focus on giving back in the community in three, three distinct areas. Um, so education, professional development, and then there are a variety of opportunities that are housed in our third pillar, which is community, which is uh, the communities that are local and specific to the locations where our rollers work and live. So 
um, that can kind of encompass quite a bit. Um, but the, the two primary pillars are education and professional development. Um, and as I said, that the group of em employees spanning different departments and different levels and different divisions curates partnerships with nonprofits in these different areas and then um, facilitates volunteer opportunities for our rollers to, to give back. And so most of that pre-COVID had been in-person volunteering. So um, lots of support through for the education pillar, um, working with students either in group settings or one-on-one -on, -one on local school campuses or having students in to the, uh, to the buildings that uh, in our different locations for either job shadowing days or um, mentorship sessions or uh, listening about career panels or just frankly to see what, what tech looks yeah. like. Yeah. Um, and, and as I said, so since COVID happened, we've, we've had to like everybody else obviously really shift the the way in which we are able to volunteer in the community and and move to 100% virtual or online model um, and really think differently about how to do that because part of the reason why our rollers really enjoy giving back um, it is one of our company values but you know one of the things that comes from it is they, they, rollers get to spend time, rollers are our employees. So I'll use that word interchangeably. Um, <laughs> rollers get to spend time together giving back in the community. And that's been a different experience since we've all moved, um, moved online. So we, we have decided specifically that giving back in the community and volunteer hours is the focus we want to maintain. Okay. Um, part of that is uh, limited by you know, the, the company budget that, that we have. And so it wasn't that we could say, okay, well, now all of a sudden we'll just uh, spend that, um, the giving back, we will pivot into more of a donation or corporate philanthropy in, in dollars uh, philosophy. So we didn't have that as a choice. Um, and I, I can talk a little bit more if we get to it on, on how that the, the giving has changed actually in this time too for, for corporate dollars and how those have been allocated. Um, but we, so we deliberately decided we continue, would continue to want to volunteer in hours and then had to reach out to the partners that we've had and we have various long-term partners and ask them how to do that, right? How, how best to meet them where they were. Um, and it's it's been, a shift um, for all of us and, and certainly on both sides of the partnerships that we've had, both about the uh, nonprofits or the school settings that we've worked with, really having to get their, their head around what should they be asking for, what can they be asking for, how can we be of most help. Um, and so earlier on in the pandemic, I think we were sort of muddling through kind of together of, of how to to do those things. And I would say now we've, we have, um, although it's not all solved, I, I think we have a much better way of thinking about it, which is that we don't necessarily need to try to create the same opportunities that we had before just virtually. And because many of those can't be done. Yeah. Um, but any way in which we can give back and volunteer where we're meeting the nonprofit where they are and they're meeting us where we are. And what, what I mean by the sort of where we are is that, you know, as you said, we're taking up precious time right now for, for people being on the Zoom call at lunch. Everyone is online so often that it's, it is hard for employees to get enticed about doing an online volunteering event, which, you know, is, is, for lack of a better word, you know, it's, it's another Zoom meeting in the day. Yeah. It's another Google meet in the day. Um, and so one of the ways in which we've been able to, to pivot from that or think a little bit differently from that is to provide this asynchronous volunteering support. Um, and mostly that has been able to uh, happen with our volunteering with students of being able to provide them um, support with college applications or 
mentoring and, and recording things that they can listen to and uh, um, gain access to in a time that works for them. And then we also um, can provide that volunteering at a time that works for us. Like, so schedule that time when we're gonna make that video recording or, or schedule the time in your calendar when you can make edits in an essay at a time that works for you. And then there's not the, the big uh, barrier that can happen right now, which is trying to find that connection of competing you know, priorities, competing calendars, competing Zoom fatigue, can, all of that kind of stuff. So I would say we've been uh, shifting as we go of how we think about things. And we're, we're getting a bit better, I think, at that creative piece of both sides meeting each other where they are. Absolutely. So for the nonprofits that are joining today, which is about half the audience roughly, uh, based on the poll, you're saying that virtual volunteerism is a key pillar to social impact for your work and it will remain the main priority for, for Next World? Yes, that's right. Okay. And yeah. have you, so you've been able to do some interesting um, recordings and kind of get a little bit clever with, with education. Have you seen any other um, really interesting pieces of virtual volunteerism that have either worked at your company or any other um, companies you work with? Yeah, um, so we did uh, postcard writing for Be The Match, um, really, which is about motivating and um, inspiring those that are going through um, bone marrow transplants yes. and saying, I see you during this time. I know that there's um, also, we're um, going to be hopefully partnering with Meals on Wheels coming up during the holiday season to do some way of also connecting with folks again with that message of, we see you, even though we, you know, we aren't gathering anymore. We can't come to your your home um, to see you, but you know, leaving a, a voicemail message or or letters or cards or anything that we can do to let folks know that they're they're not forgotten. Um, and with the the postcard writing example of what we did with Be the Match, one of the way, ways that we've um, you know seen our employees sort of adapting during this time is they, we've got these different populations of employees that are looking for different types of opportunities. So because this year has had such an impact on everyone about, you know, an awakening of, you know, just the, the state of healthcare, an awakening about the injustice um, that goes on in our society and an awakening about the food insecurity, like job loss, all of the different things. I think our rollers are, are now thinking about giving back in, in different ways than they had yeah. previously. Um, and maybe with different organizations or seeing the organizations that we have and realizing that there is a way to impact that racial injustice in a unique way because of our partnership with June Jordan, for example. Yeah. Um, and, and sorry, going, so going back to the, the postcard writing, one faction of our employee base, um, is looking for more ways to connect. So while we are trying to balance, you know, not being overly programmed and being online all the time, people do, they, they miss each other. And so the postcard writing was one of those events that you actually could do as a group. Everyone just dialed into a meeting, super casual, no major agenda with their stack of postcards to write and just connected and, and chit chatted while, while they did that. And so that was, a little bit of like a, a double, um, yeah, a, a double win there, which I think for companies maybe who are uh, on this can think in those ways too of that boost in morale and that the way of um, both being able to connect to communities in need, but also realizing your internal community may be in need of something too. So trying to, to figure out how to match those two things is is something to think about for your you're giving. So in terms of, and this will this will be the last um, question, but I think this is really important since we have so many tech people that are joining. Obviously you're um, the, the head of people over there. So, so you are on the ground kind of seeing how your employees are 
are dealing with the pandemic and, and dealing with this virtual volunteerism, how has it been received? Are you getting the same kind of positive feedback as you were getting before when you were in person doing so much? Um, the, it's gone in waves, the, is the honest okay. answer. It, um, so, you know, as I said, I think when the, when the pandemic first hit, um, we had a lot of outreach to the Next World Gives Back group to kind of say, what are we doing specifically for those yeah. who are most impacted by COVID, either health-wise or financially, um, or again, food insecurity, which uh, then created this opportunity to do grocery card drive for the students that we, we support at, at June Jordan and, and their families. Um, so that's, you know, thinking a bit differently. So I think, you know, then, then our company went through a hard time of its own and we had to let people go. And that changed sort of the, the um, morale around the office, yeah. or, you know, the, the virtual setting. And, uh, but, but people have always been, again, because it's our value, people have always been very focused on giving back. It's the, it's the communities that they're thinking about that have changed during this time. And then of course, you know, when George Floyd was murdered, it was all about how can we help um, minority owned businesses and specifically black owned businesses, or how can we help um, bl the black community that is around us um, in, New York and, and San Francisco and the other locations where we have a larger black population. Um, and so that has that has changed. I don't think the the overall sentiment of wanting to give back has changed that much, but the the focus and the what employees are asking for or looking for has has because of the the macro environment that that we're living in right now. Absolutely. All right, well, Amy, thank you so much for that insight. Um, I think Amy is great proof that virtual volunteerism is important. And I think a lot of nonprofits are struggling to understand if, you know, as they are transitioning to programming online, is it worthwhile? Are people getting value out of it? And it sounds like unequivocally, yes, it is working. You just have to get a little bit clever with the types of activities and um, avoiding the Zoom or Google or Meets or, did I name all my members? Please don't send me a nasty uh, message, but a zoo, uh, avoiding that Zoom fatigue, I think is really important. So um, Amy is gonna pop off and we are going to bring up Tina Lee. And as we uh, say goodbye to Amy, just a reminder, she will be back later to join everybody. So drop your Q and A in and hello, Tina. Hi, Jen, how are you? Well, you know, we can't say great <laughs> hey, as we discover. <laughs> How, how are you? I like, are we both going like burnt orange today? Is I that... think so. It's a very fall color, you know? <laughs> very, very fall. Um, awesome. Well, really glad to have you here. Um, so I would love to hear a little bit about what your footprint of Dropbox is in the city and how you think about social impact. Sure. I had to say, um, I think Amy did my homework or actually covered most of the things that I'm, I'm going to talk about because exactly um, her experience is very similar to what um, I, I see across uh, Dropbox as well. So um, Dropbox, as some of you may know or may not know, it's a, it's a small little company. Uh, we started out 13 years ago. Uh, the mission is really just to design an enlightened way of working. Um, and what started out as a, a file storage share company to now it's a very collaborative uh, cloud platform. And so the smart workspace is what we try to do. And obviously with with the pandemic, um, we see a lot more people working from home, obviously, as we are today. Um, so I think the, the company has grown quite a bit and we are also in 13 um, global locations right now and being headquarters in San Francisco. Uh, I lead the social impact team and a very small, dy a very dynamic and amazing team um, of three people. And so I, I think the charter that I have is, is really looking at and similar to I'm sure Amy and Amanda are going to talk about is how do we grow our social impact programs across the company, uh, enabling and empowering our employees, uh, we call ours drop boxers, um, to really kind of give back to the community in the way that they know uh, are the most um, to the causes that they care most about. So it's very cause agnostic in some ways. Um, it is an ambassador led program. We have employees around the world leading and um, putting to coordinating these events, um, you know, because they know best, right? And so they're working with local organizations from uh, food banks to schools to 
um, hospitals, uh, it, it's really up to the employee level. Company wide, I mean, like I said, you know, we also think through our, you know, our resources, right? What are we giving back? What can we give back? And so, you know, people is most important, most valued, but we also think through philanthropic contribution. And luckily, um, our co-founder set up a foundation uh, three years ago when we went public. And so the intention of the Dropbox Foundation is to support um, human rights-based organizations around the world. And currently we have seven of them. And I think I, a shout out to Larkin Street Youth Services because I think I see them on, on the list here, but partnering with meaningful organizations like that who provide the services. I mean, that's, that's ultimately what we wanna do. And we play, you know, we're just in the background and just providing that support. Um, and the third is also just through um, product, right? And so how do we think through a product donation that is also meaningful for nonprofit users? Uh, I come from a nonprofit space, so I definitely know sometimes free is not the best. Um, and so, you know, how do we partner with organizations and um, really find, figure out what are some of the challenges that they have and um, how do we kind of make that connection? So hopefully that's a, a, a long winded way to answer your question. No, absolutely. So um, obviously you've had to shift probably yes. the way that your employees are, are able to engage with those impacts and, and those causes. Um, the fact that you're global probably means that you were doing to some extent, I would assume non in-person, um, engagement with your employees before, but how has that shifted since the pandemic has hit? Yeah. So, you know, obviously the shift, I love, I love that word, um, is, is real um, and everyone feels it in many different levels, whether it's professionally or personally. So we definitely acknowledge that. Um, and so the shift has been quite honestly uh, challenging to some degree, but it's also opened up some opportunities. I'd be remiss to not say that, right? And so um, obviously we had to quickly say, okay, we're not gonna meet our employee volunteer numbers. That's okay, you know, what yeah. else can we be doing, right? And so I think it was the immediate turn to go inwards to um, look at our existing partners, like Amy said as well, like how do we provide the support, right? Um, through the foundation, we, we kind of said, hey, grantees, please don't give us any interim reports because you know, we know that you have your hands full right now and, and, that's, and that's fine. Um, and I think also just being able to really be creative with the resources, like I said, like people, right? People was so important, is so important to us. So we suddenly have access to teams that were able to give us some time um, to, and to, to serve and to support our nonprofits. We worked with the people team quite creatively. Uh, we worked with a lot of um, uh, technology teams across the company as well, but we also went, um, to kind of honed in on advocacy. And so, you know, obviously our, right. our financial could, is also limited too, but like if we can host fundraisers, campaigns, uh, webinars, lunch and learns, um, you know, providing peer matching, uh, company gift matching, unlocking those little um, programs and initiatives is a way to kind of collectively say, we are still um, supporting the community around us, but just in a, in a, in a somewhat of a different way. Uh, we also partnered with our internal teams, like the, our DEI team, Diversity, um, Equity, and Inclusion team. And so by putting on, um, this is totally not social impact, but the DEI team put on this whole series of truth and reconciliation just for mm -hmm. our employees to learn and to reflect and to really um, take that time that we need to understand how we um, fit into racial justice, right? And injustice. So that gave us an opportunity to, as a foundation, to go to focus on what are some new topics that we could be supporting in the following years that we will be planning to do grant making. So we decided on racial justice, climate change, LGBTQ plus rights, as it all relates to human rights. And that is fundamentally, um, that never changed. It's just that we, we gave this an opportunity to expand a little bit. So that's interesting. So, you know, Amy was talking a lot about how virtual volunteers and getting clever and, and doing new ways of doing volunteerism changed. But you guys have done just completely different types of, of impact, right? As you mentioned, advocacy and, and fundraisers and things like that, that weren't part of the auspice before. Um, are you thinking of social impact in a more broad lens of, of not just working with perhaps public charities, but much more now? Yeah, um, I would say it was always there. It's just kind of more of a hyper drive that we were like, okay, if we can't be there in person, 
what can yeah. we be doing, right? And so um, definitely, and as we think through 2021 as well, like virtual is gonna be here to stay. <laughs> and so we definitely wanna be creative in that. And so, um, you know, again, I, I depend on my, my volunteers around the world to give me the feedback, give us the feedback of what they're hearing um, from their local uh, communities. Um, but it's just definitely a figuring out how we can be creative, right? So for, for sure. So out of curiosity, and then we can talk a little bit more about the, the nitty gritty, but um, so as you said, talk about advocacy, does that mean that, that have you done like actual political fundraiser or, or what uh, does that advocacy look like? I'm curious yeah. how those blend. Yeah, no, good, good clarification. Um, I, I refer to more of a nonprofit advocacy. So okay. um, sharing the good work that our nonprofit partners are doing through webinars, um, we're able to use our resources like our foundation um, communication channels to amplify their work, right? So cross promoting that, um, cool. prov um, providing a funder network, you know, convening organizations, funders together to talk more about, you know, the issues of human rights, for example, or our school partnerships. So I think in that right, um, really putting the sh shining that spotlight on the nonprofits and the issues um, is kind of is the is what I'm, I'm leaning on and more focusing on yeah. right now. Well, that's, that's amazing. Putting together a, a funders coalition um, and getting them that kind of exposure is huge. So we of course have to get to this question because Dropbox <laughs> had a big announcement uh, last week, but you know, we have people that are joining from both nonprofit and from tech. So we'll, we'll start with the nonprofit uh, one first, but as Dropbox is becoming a remote first company, um, your virtual is going to be a big piece. Uh, potentially, like the majority of your of your employees could now be uh, permanently virtually engaged by your team. Um, how has that shifted your plans for impact? Um, and then, I'd love to know for a nonprofit standpoint, and then also for the many tech um, employees that are joining today that maybe have had their companies consider a similar switch. Some thoughts about how you made those decisions. Yes. Well, thanks. Thanks for bringing that. Um, yes. So just last week, our company announced we are becoming a virtual first company, um, which really means that the day to day experience of all of our employees will do remote will be remote uh, our individual work. But we still have the flexibility of, um, of being able to I mean, but so to say that because I'm still going through these stages of uh, understanding, absorbing what that means to me as an employee, but like we are still maintaining physical spaces in the cities that we have a presence in. So the 13 uh, offices that we have, the locations that we have. And so we're turning those offices, offices into studios. So we're calling them Dropbox studios. The intention for that is really to facilitate when it's safe to do so, facilitate in-person team gathering and collaboration. Because we all know, I mean, let's face it, we, we love, we miss community, we miss people, we miss human interaction. And so we still, I, I truly um, admire the company and the leadership team to really think and be thoughtful about that. Um, and, the, and, and also to note, just to, to say that they were intentional not to go uh, a different approach um, or like a hybrid approach, which is very common now, um, but really because we wanted to ensure that we address any barriers or avoid any barriers to any um, inequities, um, exclusion, we want to make sure it's a level playing field for all employees, right? And so uh, I definitely respect that. And I think it will take some time to getting used to. Um, in terms of nonprofits, certainly, I mean, we're still trying to figure that out. And we hope that people are patient, patient with us. Um, the first step the company did was put out a virtual toolkit that we're, it's all open source. This is what we're all learning about um, communication, people, physical locations, the work that we do. Everything is online. Um, we're also thinking through those actual spaces, like how can we benefit the nonprofits um, that we partner with, right? And so yeah. is it a location that probably gonna be, can facilitate a larger group? So maybe we can bring them in and, and use those spaces. Um, mm -hmm. But also, like I said, just the virtual volunteering. I don't think we've cracked the nut yet, but I think there's so much to more to do, but I, we're, we're very open for, to ideas, um, but also just to ensuring that it is, it is reflective of what the nonprofit needs. And that's what's most important to our team. I do think it's very interesting what you shared about how you're learning, you, you're learning to use your own voice as Dropbox, the big you know, tech company, you know, 
honestly, you are a fairly big tech, tech company in San Francisco, <laughs> but using that voice to advocate for the nonprofits um, and spread the awareness and spread like uh, messages about some of the events and the work that they're doing. Um, I do think that that's a really interesting way to tackle using your impact for good in, in a way that I don't know that is necessarily the first to come to mind. How, how do we use distribution channels with our funders? Uh, and that's a really great idea. I can't take credit. Um, obviously, I know a lot of my peers are, are trying to do the same thing, or you know, we're all acting on it. Honestly, at the end of the day, we're we're all we're all like in in this together. We're all intertwined, whether pre COVID or not. Um, we are all contributors to our society and our community and our environment. Um, so nonprofits are our customers. We are, you know, we we live in the, these cities that we work in. So definitely trying to see hand in hand. Um, and also just to avoid any duplicative work, right? And so, and any support that way. So if we can, you know, put it partnered up and buddy up, why not? Um, because we can, the power of the network, the power of just more people together is, is so much more effective um, and efficient. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so anybody listening, you know, this is, this is a good reminder. <laughs> Talk to the companies that you work with and see if you can utilize some of their channels. Um, I know that that's something we've started to really do at SF City and it makes a huge, huge difference. Even in um, this event alone, being able to, to use some of the company's distribution networks, we're able to spread it to so many more people. All right, so Tina, we shall say adieu for um, just a few more minutes and Amanda Linnigan, let's invite you up on stage. Hello, hello, how are you? Hi, Jen. I'm great, actually. I'm going to go with that. And You're thank you it. so much for having me. Uh, it's so wonderful to join the conversation and learn from Amy and Tina um, and realize, you know, we're all struggling with some um, of the same challenges, but there's some pretty interesting opportunities that have presented themselves um, at this time. So I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Well, thank you uh, for joining. Just a reminder to everyone, I see our Q&A is starting to pop off. Amanda and I are going to do our chat, but as we are chatting, please feel free to keep throwing all your questions in. All of our lovely ladies will be back at the end and we will get to as many as possible. So Amanda, tell us a little bit about this little tiny self-driving car company that might have just got a pretty big announcement in San Francisco and uh, what your footprint looks like and what impact means to you. Yeah, thank you. So um, we are a self-driving car company based here in San Francisco. It's our hometown. Um, we did just receive a permit from um, the DMV to begin um, testing our driverless cars um, here in San Francisco. So uh, that is a huge milestone for us in the company. And um, it's, it's just a, a very exciting um, turning point for our technology because the, the goal is really to build the world's most advanced self-driving vehicles and we're doing that to connect people in a way that's safer, better for the environment, and more accessible for more people. So I really feel like a lot of our um, mission has social impact fundamentally baked into it. And with the pandemic hitting, we have absolutely taken a turning point in expanding social impact. Um, so there have been some pretty incredible opportunities that Cruise has just been honored to be a part of. Um, and, and I think it has opened windows for us that um, you know, we hadn't, we didn't have on our social impact roadmap for the immediate term, um, but I'm really proud to talk about today. So one of the things that's really fascinating um, about the way that, that Chris is doing social impact is that you're using your technology. Um, and I'd love to hear more about how you've been able to utilize um, the cars and, and how that has worked in the pandemic. I imagine that it was not part of your plan for social impact to be uh, deploying these cars to do deliveries. So we'd love to hear about how that story uh, came about. Yeah, absolutely. So when the pandemic first hit, um, you know, we saw the devastation taking place in San Francisco. And um, like everyone, you know, we moved everyone remote, uh, made sure our employees were safe and taken care of, but then looked around our hometown and asked ourselves, what can we do? Um, and what can we do in a safe way, right? Um, so learning about the rise in food insecurity, which already has been mentioned today, I think that was just one of the leading indicators of just the breadth and depth of this crisis. Um, so we spoke with local food banks who were telling us that um, they're really struggling to meet the unprecedented demand 
um, for food in our city. Um, so we partnered with San Francisco and Marin Food Bank and also a new nonprofit called SF New Deal to really help them scale from serving a few hundred families to over 10,000. And they were looking to do that um, on a dime. So um, Cruise in a couple of weeks was able to reposition our all electric autonomous fleet of vehicles to really be put to use delivering food. So groceries, meals um, to some of the most vulnerable populations across the city. And um, you know that was uh, much more than simply a social impact program. It was a fundamental um, shift um, by our leadership to say, you know, how can we use any resources we have to respond to this moment of crisis right now? So um, I'm really proud that we've delivered over 110,000 meals as a part of this effort that we started in April. Um, and when we look at the roadmap of where we've been doing de these deliveries, it's in the neighborhoods where COVID rates are the highest and, uh, you know, poverty is the highest. It's really um, going to to the areas that need us the most. And so it has been absolutely an honor for Cruz to get to leverage our technology in this way and play a small role in addressing what's a, a pretty significant need right now. And how, how did that partnership come about? Did, did they come to you or, or how did that actually start? We are always um, having conversations with our community partners and also with just leaders in the community. So there were some organic conversations happening and it was at a time when we knew our vehicles were um, no longer you know, being utilized on the streets for our testing. So um, it really came about organically and that's what I love about this program. It, it wasn't um, you know, my typical uh, plan for social impact would be doing yeah. a full needs assessment and looking at how we leverage all assets of our company to really move the needle on an issue yeah. and I mean this <laughs> came together um, very quickly and um, we have the benefit of our leadership really thinking nimbly and um, a lot of our team members are pretty plugged in in the city so it was a really organic mutual partnership that formed um, and you know we're, we're one part of, of a broader solution here so we're not the um, only uh, partner working with these organizations but I think we have um, found that you know, when you're when you're plugged into the city and leaders in the city and the nonprofits, and you know, you really can respond at a time like this. Um, we follow their lead and see what we can do, and it has blossomed into a really powerful um, program that you know we're we're really happy to have been a part of. Awesome. So this is a little so yours is it's interesting. Your social impact experience is a little different um, than I think both both Tina and Amy has been. I'm curious how the employee experience has played into your impact strategy and um, to what extent you see the next, let's say, 12 months of impact. How do you see it being leveraging your tech versus leveraging kind of your employees and, and their skills? Yeah, so we absolutely have a passionate group of 1,700 employees at Cruz, the majority of whom are based in San Francisco. Um, and prior to the pandemic, uh, we're planning a pretty significant um, week that we've called Future Works Week. Um, we actually um, were putting in place this program pre-COVID to empower students and job seekers during a time of accelerating change and now a time that you know, has a lot of added complications um, for the student population, especially um, for individuals that are from underserved communities. Um, and at Cruise, what's unique is uh, we're working on the future. So our employees are engineers that are building these self-driving cars, it's a really fascinating um, company to be able to bring students into who are interested in STEM or engineering when we're able to be in person. So this program and that concept of um, really being able to support students and um, others who are you know, developing their careers in a way that um, gets them excited about engineering fields or about where um, the future careers might be in this space. Um, that has always been on the roadmap for us in terms of formalizing the program. But what changed with COVID is we um, you know, certainly shifted to a virtual format. Um, and I actually think it benefited us and our nonprofit um, collaborators in a way that we were, we were actually able to scale our program um, in, uh, in a way that I don't know that we would have um, in person out of the gate. So a couple of weeks ago, our Future Works Week brought together over 200 community members and crews employees um, through the series of, of virtual events and educational events. And um, 
one of our partners in one of the events was with Tech SF out of the, the city's Office of Economic and Workforce Development. And I see JVS is in our virtual room here too, and they were a key partner as well. Um, they were absolutely wonderful to partner with. We put together an event that brought together five different nonprofits, all supporting workforce development in some way. So some supporting students like Dev Mission or Code Tenderloin, others like JVS and Upwardly Global who are helping folks pivot in their careers and um, upskill or learn um, new careers at this time. Um, so to be able to bring in one event, 75 people together with our employees, um, to have them not only hear from a career panel, but get to go into breakout sessions that were great for networking, but also for skill building and getting resume and LinkedIn reviews. Um, that was all really tangible. And um, it also, um, I think the virtual benefit was there was uh, an ability to re remove some of the barriers that might normally be there, like transportation and how do you accommodate 75 people in a room um, and move around and find different breakout rooms. So we really took advantage of that. And thanks to you know having these great partners to collaborate with and, and run this program, um, I think we had um, a pretty resounding um, success in terms of uh, the impact that the students reported um, as a result of this experience and our employees as well. So we went ahead and measured you know, how do you, for the nonprofit participants, how do you um, feel this experience helped in your career journey? And did you build confidence in mock interviews and things like that? Um, so it was great to learn that it was tangible for them. And then on the employee side, you know, we're looking at how we are uh, building pride in our company at a time like this. Are we also encouraging employees then to take that next step and maintain a relationship that they formed during that day or get more involved in the community? So um, I'm really proud to report that it was um, really a resounding success. And I think one of the greatest compliments we received from the city's um, Tech SF leadership was that we created community. They were really um, shared with us, us that this was the first time since the pandemic hit that they felt a sense of community. And so um, when we did a reflection at the end of the event and went around and heard from each of the students or a handful, we didn't get to hear from everybody since it was so large, um, just having the space for people to, to realize that, you know, we really are in this together and our employees genuinely and authentically want to be there um, and connect with individuals who really need us right now. Um, and individuals are feeling heard, they're feeling validated, they're getting the chance to meet in industry professionals in a future career they want to have. Um, I was really proud that you know, we um, took advantage of the moment in the best possible way um, to look at how we reshape um, our programs in a way that can be um, additive and maybe create some extra scale and benefit rather than, you know, thinking of it as a negative that we have to be in a virtual format. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the the best question for us to, to end with, and this is one that I bet all of the um, tech uh, leaders that are joining today are, are asking is, Amanda, how on earth did you get your leadership to deploy your technology, your proprietary technology that I'm sure is under some pretty crazy confidentiality? Um, what tips do you have how you can get your engineering teams and maybe your R&D teams to work with impact and, and be able to do this kind of amazing project, quite honestly? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, mentioning leadership is key. So, you know, we had the support from the top. And in fact, that's where the directive was coming from. So, I mean, that's an absolute game changer when you're trying to roll out a, a new social impact program. But I think when you're thinking about, you know, the benefits of social impact and what success looks like and the impact on your business, um, uh, we really want to see our technology authentically put to good use. And social impact is actually creating that opportunity right now. So we are building relationships in the community. We're building trust. We're fostering our culture internally through this program. It's a huge rally point and pride um, for employees right now. And we're responding to a huge need in our city. So um, I think while, while we can put together the business case and all of the um, you know, really tangible um, results from some social impact programs to upsell the leadership and share why this is valuable. Um, I think some of the greatest benefits we're seeing from social impact are actually immeasurable and are coming from being integrated into the fabric of our community, build, yeah. building partnerships and collaboration in a way that, you know, we know is key to us for being successful as a business. 
Um, and it's not something that we measure, but it's absolutely invaluable. And our leadership and employees get this. I mean, this is the most unequal economic recession in American history. So um, our employees, as soon as COVID hit, we put together a, a giving campaign. They raised almost half a million dollars for Give to SF for um, some global causes. I mean, they are motivated to be a part of the solution and respond to what's happening here in San Francisco because that's that's Cruz's model. It's to be yeah. deploying in a way that we are um, creating this, this new form of technology and transportation with our community. The whole hope is that we are improving people's lives. Um, so it has been um, actually a, a real honor for social impact to be a leading force at this time. And I think for the nonprofits and um, companies on the line, I think that framing is absolutely key. And I think leadership that are, are very connected to what's going on in our community absolutely get that. Yeah. I mean, that goodwill that, that's generated from this kind of partnership, that's the kind of thing that can go a really, really long way in the San Francisco community. Okay, so let's bring back Tina and Amy to join Amanda. We've got um, quite, a, quite a slew of questions popping in, ladies. We got everybody here? Okay, off of mute. Nobody's gonna do the, the usual, okay. All right, so let's get to our Q&A. Uh, first question, and how about, we'll start with you, Amy. How are companies working with smaller grassroots nonprofits? Any tips that you would give? And then we'll go to Tina and then Amanda. Yeah. Um, I think our experience in, in working with grassroots or the smaller nonprofits is those who reach out and have a a story or a community that we can impact that fits within what our company has publicly said we are focused on, which is education, uh, professional development, and again, as I said, you know, the communities where we work and live specifically. Um, and so if a grassroots organization is looking for additional support, I would suggest that they get a sense of where different companies are focused with their philanthropic um, giving, whether that's volunteering or donations and really target those that match the, the profile of, of what they, they need. Um, and, and you'll have a much better uh, chance of, you know, getting a response and, and getting engagement. And that's on our side too, of the way in which we promote giving back across our employees. Um, if there is a direct connection with the either the type of work that our employees do or the causes that are um, you know known that folks are caring about and, and are focused on, we're much more likely to be able then to actually provide you with those um, hands or, or virtual hands uh, for whatever your your volunteer needs might be as well. Tina. Yeah, I, I would echo echo what Amy said. Um, I also think that um, the employee base is super powerful as well. Um, a lot of these companies have employee resource groups or employee interest groups, um, whether it's, um, we call it internally, Black Dropboxers, uh, Latinx group, Asian group. We all celebrate and we try, we all celebrate and try to bring awareness to the company through uh, heritage months. And so I, I think if the grassroots uh, nonprofits are able to connect with, um, whether it's a social impact team um, or the employee uh, ERGs that help to facilitate this month, for us it's a month long of activities. Uh, we also you know, try to really um, amplify that community pillar and that giving back. And so I think that's a, a, hopefully a, a, an example of how we can work with smaller nonprofits around uh, different locations. Amanda? I, would, I would just echo um, that employee relationship is a great place to start. I think when smaller organiz organizations are looking to build a relationship um, internally at any company, I think that's a great starting point. We have um, over 1400 of our employees are on, on our, our um, giving channel dedicated to social impact out of 1700. So um, people are very invested. And I think that whether you get involved via an employee resource group or um, have a different employee that's championing your cause. We've had um, 
it completely employee led programs like supporting first robotics and an all girls um, high school robotics team called the misfits um, that organically started from employees that were just mentoring and excited about this group we then took them in and now they build their robots on site pre COVID um, at cruise and so um, that's just an example of I think when you build relationships internally and have those employee champions. Um, it can really um, become something formal in the long run. Great. Tina, I have a question for you. Um, what is the best way for a nonprofit to get in touch with Dropbox or other tech companies about these volunteer opportunities or, or their needs that they have? Yeah, so um, I think hopefully, you know, there, there are email addresses for all our social impact teams. I, I think that's something we try to be visible on our website or through our channels. So I think that way, uh, obviously directly, I'm happy to share my contact information. Um, I think also one thing I forgot to mention earlier of how do we get in touch and again, putting on my nonprofit fundraiser hat on as I had previously, um, all of these companies most of these companies have giving platforms, right? And so um, identify, try to identify what companies or what software they use, because oftentimes when a disaster hits, for example, or um, there are certain campaigns, we can easily create giving campaigns and launch um, peer matching or company match if a company has, but driving that awareness internally. And sometimes a nonprofit may not know that, right? And so, or don't know how to get in touch. I think that's an easy way for employees that companies do that. Um, so I, I think that's one, one example, um, but also th just through networks. I think a lot of my peers here are, are, are available um, in terms of in present in, um, in many other convenings and networks and professional networks that we have. And so if there's a way that we can connect there, I think um, just driving, uh, making that connection, but also understanding what, like Amy said, understanding what the company's focus is, philanthropic focus, is definitely makes it a lot easier for us to help champion that internally as well. Great. All right, Amy, I got a question for you from John at Optimize. Say hello, hello. We missed you. Um, employees really miss volunteering together. Um, so we did have some examples of, of how employees could join a Zoom and hang out and, and make cards and things like that. But curious if you have seen any really good synchronous virtual, virtual volunteering opportunities. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the examples of a, a synchronous volunteer opportunity that um, I know folks really enjoy, it was synchronous for the volunteers, but not for the, the audience. Um, and I think I mentioned it just briefly was that, are, um, you know, we, we have a very long standing partnership with June Jordan School for Equity in San Francisco. They're an amazing, amazing school. And um, one of the ways in which we volunteer help support how we have a, a partnership with them is helping the students to see pathways into tech or um, whatever they want to continue per to pursue in higher education or in, in their careers. And so we help them with job applications and other things. Um, and one of those opportunities that we typically do in person, as, as I mentioned before, is having students into the office and doing a career panel and they get to ask questions. You share what your background is. Students are typically very surprised that not everyone went to a four-year university or you know to, to Yale or Harvard or any of the, the Ivy League schools. And, um, and so this year, what we did was the videotaped um, career panel. And ahead of time, we had the students ask the questions that with some prompting from their teachers, because sometimes they don't know what to ask yet and, until they get the information. But um, what did they want to know about the, the career panelists' backgrounds? What were they interested to hear about? And then the, the volunteers got together and were interviewed by one of our partners at the San Francisco Ed Fund. And that session was videotaped and the volunteers got to, the panel got to have that shared experience together and they got to hear the stories from their colleagues of how they got into tech and, and what their um, pathway was for themselves. And then that, that video was shared with students at, at different times and they could uh, get into it on their own time. So that's a, a slightly, you know, it's a different one where you're not engaging with the same volunteers at the same time, but you're 
employees are getting a shared experience of volunteering together. And then they've got that, um, they have that experience together to, to talk about, to brainstorm about how could they do some more of those types of things as well. Thank you. Amanda, I have a question for you. What advice would you give to a young nonprofit that's just starting up um, about how to form their first corporate partnership? You, you give me only this, the easy questions, right, Jen? Just like, uh, <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> so like Tina, I actually uh, spent a lot of my career leading nonprofits and also leading cross-sector partnerships. So um, I can put that hat on. Um, I think I, I really believe really strongly in building strong relationships. So when you're thinking about building out your board as a nonprofit, you're thinking about who that board has connections to. And authentically, I think what you've heard today, like where do you align with your mission as an organization and what you're trying to affect in our community with the goals um, or you know, what other companies are trying to affect. So I think when you have the relationship and connection in place and then you have that mission alignment, um, that really makes a strong case for then doing that introductory meeting and getting to know each other. I think it's all about looking at shared goals. Again, this concept of creating shared value, I think is what a lot of us are trying to do through social impact. So we want to be um, learning from you all. You have a lot to give as nonprofit leaders in terms of insights, your connections to the community. So I also would remind you that you know, you're bringing a lot to the table as well that's beneficial to companies um, and to lead with that um, lens as well. Um, but hopefully that gives a few just nuggets of um, how I would think about it, um, which um, I'm learning every day. So um, in this virtual world, I know it's harder than ever to, to kind of run into people and build these authentic uh, uh, chats where you're getting to know that shared interest. But I think people are really willing to take meetings and um, get to know each other and use this time to continue to build human connection and further all of our causes, so. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one thing that's, that's really interesting is I've noted that I'm getting a lot more inbound. We, you know, as, as SF City, as that connector, we get a lot of inbound of people who want to do informational interviews and get uh, coffees and things like that. But I've seen a huge uptick on my LinkedIn of, of people that want to just kind of do these Zoom chat um, get togethers to, to talk about how we can work together. And um, I'm always up for them. And, and I'm curious, uh, you know, does is, is anybody have any other like tips of how to actually connect uh, since we cannot meet in person? Maybe Amanda, we'll start with you and then Tina and Amy. I mean, I think I've seen most of the um, connections happening virtually so far. Um, yeah. But I, I think that is um, most likely, I think the safest way we're all comfortable connecting for the near term. Um, but I, I think what's beneficial about that is you don't have to be in the same location. You don't have to be in um, you know, the same city or neighborhood to do that. Um, and I, I think also just an exchange over LinkedIn without meeting first is helpful too, to learn more about each other. Um, so, you know, I always welcome that. And I also think um, people have been very gracious about time and flexibility. And um, if you can't take the meeting this week, you know, maybe next month we can work it out. Um, so I think just assuming good intent from everyone and being gracious and, um, you know, that always, um, I think, is, is then brought back to you. So I think that's a philosophy that, um, you know, I certainly try to take. And I also try and prioritize meeting people from different backgrounds that, you know, it's great to talk with folks from my alma mater, but it's also really great. And I try and prioritize conversations for people that I wouldn't normally be in the same circle with. Tina, you said emails, of course, but any other <laughs> ways to connect that you'd recommend? Yeah, you know, I benefited a lot from convenings and webinars like this and, you know, bringing virtual convenings together because not only, you know, as a participant or as a speaker, you learn from each other, you hear from each other. Um, so a lot of these social impacts um, networks, I, I'm, I feel like they're popping up more and more just because it's become the, the venue, right, to get your information to learn from each other, to spread any announcements that you may have or to look for partners. I think that's been helpful and then take it off side conversation in a, you know, a coffee chat, a virtual coffee chat. Um, internally, we've been seeing these new, our, our people team have been trying new different creative ways of doing like a, a coffee box, I think, and just kind of like assigning you well, with your special interests, of course, in common interests um, to chatting with people. Normally, like I would never, 
see or or um, be able to. So I think that's interesting to help foster that you know that connection. Um, but obviously LinkedIn too. I mean, I think LinkedIn has become um, the place. But also if you mm -hmm. can have um, to make it even more, uh, I think, in, um, enticing or just making sure it's someone visible, like drop a couple of notes to say why, or, or, you know, is there something that you want that person to see or know or, or to, to have respond to? I think that makes an extra step of like, let's take a pause. Definitely. How can I fit you? How can we make this work and, and, and talk? Yeah, absolutely. I would say, um, you know, I was, I was mentoring um, a, a young professional that she's just starting her career earlier today. And she said, well, I don't really go on LinkedIn very often. I was like, you got to change that. I mean, LinkedIn is like the place where it happened. I swear right now. Um, Amy? Um, I think the only thing to, to add to what else has been said I guess would be two things. One is that every meeting doesn't have to be a video. So if you can um, stay up front that piece that might make people more likely to want to connect to just say, hey, give me a call. Like I'm open to a call when you're on a walk or I'm open to a call, you know, when you're making lunch for your kids or just a quick, a quick chat like that. So using a phone instead of, um, instead of always thinking that a meet needs to be video because there is a bit of a yeah. barrier or an access point threshold there of like you gotta you know dress up maybe you, you have to look presentable Do your hair <laughs> yeah that's right um and then just the other thing i mean if we're talking about a, a way in which folks are trying to connect maybe to get advice or mentorship is um being really specific about uh one or two questions that you might have not a hey i'd love to pick your brain that, that can seem intimidating and you know you don't know, oh, what does that mean? Am I gonna need to carve out an hour and a half for this call or is that you know five minutes? So just being very specific of like, I have two things I wanna run by, by you. It should take 10 minutes tops. Can you yeah. do that? It's very hard to say no to that, right? Like, and, and, and you wouldn't want to, right? Yeah, to, I yeah. have 10 minutes and I'd, I'm open to providing advice for, for two, um, areas that that you need advice in so just being specific. specific yeah yeah awesome okay we're gonna do one uh two quick lightning rounds so i'm gonna ask you a quick question we'll start with you amy since you're we're, we're still doing it um let's unmute you for a second what percent of volunteerism for 2021 will be virtual versus in person uh this is my guess or what whatever you want to put out there for everybody as they plan next year. Oh, I think for our sorry, Jen, this was be a lightning round, but I've got questions for our organization or just in general. What do I predict the amount of virtual volunteering will be for the industry wide? Let's just say if you're a nonprofit yeah. and you're well, trying I'm, to plan next year, I'm going to go 80 to 90 percent. Virtual. virtual, yes. Okay, Tina. Um, I'm gonna say seventy to eighty percent virtual. Okay, Amanda. I'm in that range too. I was leaning towards ninety percent. I think next year we're leading with virtual, and in person is likely the exception, at least in our geography. Okay. Well, for those of y'all that lasted to the very end, I think we just got like the most golden nugget of the entire talk. Uh, all right, let's do the last uh, lightning round. Amanda, number one piece of advice um, for nonprofits going into 2021. Be gracious with yourselves. I think just acknowledge that um, you have a lot of weight that you probably feel you're carrying on your shoulders. You're the safety net for our community. Um, so all of us are incredibly grateful for your leadership. Um, and I think right now the keys are just being um, gracious, flexible, um, and doing the best that you can. Tina? Uh, yes, be honest, be truthful, tell us your challenges. Um, so because we, we definitely want to be helpful in however way we can um, financially and beyond. Uh, I think without knowing the real um, the challenges and barriers that nonprofits see um, is, is the first step, right? And so definitely um, fosters a stronger partnership as well. And Amy. Yeah, um, somewhat similar to Tina, I would say ask for, for what you need. 
This is a, a moment in time where giving back, uh, making donations, the, those who have in some ways have more because of the lack of discretionary spending on travel and in other um, ways that they might be spending that money. And so, you know, this is in some way, this is your time. Ask for it. I'm Ask for it. All right. Well, everybody, you have made it to the very end. Thank you so much, um, Amanda, Tina, Amy. You guys have been incredible. Thank you for sharing all of your expertise and wisdom and just some positive stories um, right now. Uh, we, we're going through a shift, but shift does not have to be a bad thing. There's a lot of opportunities in the challenge and uh, we really appreciate having you all. Thank you for joining everyone. This will be shared out so you can do all of your notes and watch this as many times as possible. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thanks, Jen. Thanks for having us, Jen. Thank you.